Checkity, checkity, check. So today is going to be a little bit different. Judah had to do some traveling today, so it's just going to be me here on the Surfing Violinist Podcast. And uh, we might do some more audience participation since I don't have somebody to bounce ideas off. And Judah kind of helps rein me in and bring some organization to the proceedings. So that'll be any viewer's job today. Judah's been asking a lot about what do we do with all this Ford rant stuff that kind of comes out of my mind about the state and about uh, doing things the, the same old way, the status quo, you know, whatever's wrong with consumerism or, uh, capitalism as it exists in our current day. And good morning, Kushal. How are you doing? So Judah's been saying, you know, it's like in some ways it's kind of impractical. A lot of what I'm saying, it's real abstract, like it's I- idealistic, but how do you actually apply it in the real world? Uh, how do we move from being just consumers to being more uh, active and creative. Um, working, working pretty much. Uh, I did put in my notice at the job that I'm in, so next week will be my last week at that job. Um, I've been doing, uh, basically it's, they call it water mitigation when there's like a house that has water damage, take out all the affected drywall and insulation and that kind of stuff. And then you also do uh, cleaning of any mold, microbial growth, that kind of thing. Get the house ready to be rebuilt. Um, But I've just really, in the past eight months, I've realized I'd rather do the reconstruction part itself. This uh, next couple of weeks, we're going to be moving out of this house. Um, We've been staying, helping uh, here at my parents' house, helping my dad a little bit. Uh, He's doing okay, and uh, we we all need some space. We've been living on top of each other so we'll be moving to a little trailer uh not too far away from where we are but it'll, we'll have like a little more room uh than we have now so and in there it was going to require some work so i gotta do some remodeling and that kind of thing so and i'll be doing that for a day job as well there's some a lot of contractors in town so i've met some uh, and i'll be working for them doing just remodeling putting up drywall siding roof you know, just a bunch of stuff. So that's pretty much it. Manual labor. Uh, and I'm doing the podcast on the side. It's kind of uh, to preserve sanity and to get some of my ideas out there. And uh, me and Judah have always had a good time talking on these podcasts. So I hope some viewers are uh, getting something out of it. I did. Yeah, that was my original song. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, trying to be creative trying to move from this whole, uh, cause I'm as guilty of it as anybody moving from just watching stuff nonstop, you know, just binging Netflix or binging whatever. And instead of doing that, uh, try to be inspired by what I watch or read, um, or listen to, and then make something new. So I'm going to kind of talk about that process a bit today. Uh, what happened to my India content? Uh, well, I mean, I haven't been in India for three uh, we're coming up on three years it was 2000 was it three man it seems like it seems like eight years ago it seems like so long um but no i don't think it was was it yeah that's right it was three years ago it'll be august or september it'll be three years um and you know youtube has just changed the type of content i did that was indie related has been it's impossible to monetize anymore i mean i know i know some indians liked that t-series beat pewdiepie in the subscriber war but uh one of the problems with that is when you give these giant corporations power then you can't upload anything about anything so it's not possible to monetize holly bolly videos and i don't have time to i don't have time to make 30 cents to make a holly bolly video i mean i lost money making that last one like 800 people watched it or something it's like okay and it wouldn't let me monetize it even though it's a a movie you can watch for free on youtube that uh that south indian one um what's the name of it uh aluda majaka so yeah i mean and i i had that written for a while been meaning to do it but yeah i uploaded it got less than a thousand views 
and so yeah, it's kind of it kind of sucks. But after after the whole video reaction phase, like when people were reacting to Indian trailers, Indian movie trailers and stuff like that, they were able to monetize it at one point. But uh, now it's just not possible. I mean, it's just lit. It's not possible to monetize any even mentioning something that's in pop culture, like Universal Music Group or T Series, or someone's just going to monetize it. Like you talk about something and they can monetize it at this point. There's like, there's no fair use on YouTube at all. So, and uh, there's change their algorithms around. So it's just, I mean, nothing gets views. Even when I do stuff that's indie related, it doesn't get views. So yeah, my subscriber count is, is really inflated in comparison to view count because I mean, I've just had to change my con content. Yeah. I mean, again, I, it, they'll just, I mean, it's, it's a waste of my time. I can't do a holly bolly on does up now up now it's going to take me 25 hours to make that thing um it'll get 2500 views which is worth uh two dollars and fifty cents so i mean just do the math i can't i mean i can't get paid two cents an hour sorry man and furthermore i demonetized my youtube channel this week because it's like i'm tired of youtube getting i'm just tired of seeing how they've just basically cannibalized the whole idea of their website it's supposed to be YouTube, but they've turned it into Universal Music Group Tube. They've turned it into T Series Tube. So, and you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry. So many Indians just sided with T Series in that battle between a YouTuber and this giant corporation, and uh, like uh, Americans and the Western world was not sitting there like, oh, I can't wait for Universal Music Group to take over all of public, you know, uh, public domain on the internet. I mean, they they account for thirty percent of like YouTube ad revenue or something like that. Universal Music Group. I mean, they don't have like a bajillion subscribers, but it doesn't matter. They have they have like uh, copyright for so many songs. And uh, like Gus Johnson got copyright claimed for mentioning a song that's in their catalog. And T-Series doing the same thing. So it's like, okay, fine. I mean, you all, it, congratulations. You got T-Series and Universal Music Group too. Awesome, guys. Okay, because we didn't have enough corporate controlled media already. Awesome. Well done. So I demonetize my channel because I'm, I'm just not going to let these people make money off of my work. Like I get I get like a five cent cut and they get a 95 cent cut at this point. What's the point? So. Yes. Uh, so Guy Rose says inspiration never transforms into action and creativity festers and stagnates. That's the problem with my, our generation binging is making me dead inside action wise. And I'm just as guilty. And that's one of the things that, that Judah was saying last week, I was saying how I don't really want to get into this whole, you know, like Joe Rogan does this sober October thing. And, and I grew up in the Christian church and, and sometimes they will do these kind of like, I don't know, like you give up, well, you know, in the Catholic church, they'll give up Lent. Um, I know in Islam, they got the Ramadan thing and, and, uh, even in, in Hinduism, I think there are certain fasts that you do and there are certain ways to like give up something, you know, or if you think of it in a secular way, the Greek philosophers with stoicism, right? Like you give up something so that you can, uh, you can kind of free your mind a bit from compulsion, you know, from desire. Um, and I've kind of been, I don't know, pushing back against that to some degree because I, I feel like that's a good way to connect with people. Um, and if, you know, if you're like a teetotaler and not, not participating in what the rest of the culture is, you kind of get out of touch. But at the same time, like you said, it's like when you binge, whether it's eating or drinking or smoking or just consuming content nonstop, uh, it just, it just fills your head. And it, so you're just kind of turn into the cesspool. Like there's not, if there's nothing going out, then all it is, is just this, you know, primordial goo, you know? So we're going to talk a bit about that today. Judah couldn't join us today, so it's going to be me and y'all. Uh, so I hope some of this can be constructive. I'll read a couple more of these, and then we'll dive into the, the essay of the day. Um, yes, become mentally obese, consuming entertainment all day. I, I think, no, I think that's true. I think become, like, not even consumptively obese. It's not even creative anymore, you know. Uh, Ian says, I lived in India two years and it took me a few years to go, to get over the culture shock when I came back to the U.S. I drove on the left side of the road on accident the first day. Now, I've done that kind of thing too. Um, 
one of my first trips overseas. I came back. I almost did that as well. Uh, yeah, and for me, it's been almost three years now, and I'm almost feeling normal. Almost. Uh, and this has been a real weird three years for everybody, politically all around the world. I mean, uh, there's just a lot of cultural and popular tension. Uh, you know, India, Europe, Britain, America, and I think everyone's kind of just felt frazzled. Um, and we make fun of each other, whatever side of debates we are all on. But I think we all do feel some kind of angst. You know, it's like it just it feels like there's something not connecting. You know, and I, I feel like I just don't have uh, as many good, like, just, I don't know, heart to heart sitting down with people and, and, and relaxing, you know, just like sharing food and relaxing. Um, so. Sharia says, I feel there should be a way around the corporate BS. What do you think it is? I think YouTube will probably do something in the next couple of years that'll get back kind of kind of to what it was uh, prior to 2010, somewhere around there. I don't know, maybe the golden years for YouTube were like between 2009 and 2012 or so, somewhere in that vicinity because they weren't making it so difficult to monetize your channel. Um, and they opened it up so more people could, um, but they weren't, they weren't just being like Gestapo with their, uh, content ID policies. Once content ID, you know, the bot goes through and sees you use three notes from this song. A lot of times it's wrong, by the way. I mean, it's gotten better. It's gotten actually a lot better. But back then when it first got content ID, where a bot was coming to make sure that you weren't stealing somebody's music, uh, they, they got wrong songs. They would just, uh, they like... They said this one song was some, I don't know, like 70s band or something like that. I think I covered a Radiohead song or something like that. So it's like uh, it, there's just all, there was just all sorts of weird uh, stuff going on with just if you did any work at all um, and there was somebody else's content on it, even if you uh, were changing it, remixing it, commenting on it, critiquing it, parodying it, they just con they just claim the whole video, uh, and they've got they've got much better technology now where they could just claim like that ten seconds or something like that or claim a portion. They can do that. I mean, they can do math. I presume you know if it's a five minute video and you got five seconds of content, why are you why are you making it an all or nothing game? You know, I mean, someone put in ten hours into that video, and you, you know the, you really think that the Beatles needs that extra eighth of a penny from that five notes it's not i mean the beatles didn't in, you know invent a d minor chord like i just ah, golly it's just it's insane this whole intellectual property nonsense so i don't know uh youtube's hands are tied in some ways because there's just our intellectual property law is like 80 years behind the times it just doesn't make sense in a, in a digital world it makes no sense like if you want to keep your intellectual property keep it off the freaking internet that's my my whole mentality about it and people are like, well that doesn't work well it does work i mean it does work. You, you, we never had this thing before. You can't just apply old school. You can't act like you have a, a citadel and castle walls and put you and pretend that you put your content behind it. You didn't. You uploaded it to stream on the internet. Like it's it's like putting it's like putting your if you have your film on a DVD and putting it outside and telling everyone no you can't watch it. Like you, you didn't put a guard on duty. You didn't have a cash register. And why is it even out there then? So there's just this, the internet just messes everything up. The, the whole old legal, legal structure of copyright and intellectual property. But I mean, it's just the, the law behind it is 30 years behind the times. And the same thing goes for politics and so much, I guess. So I, I don't really know what YouTube can do. I mean, I, you know, it's easy, I guess, to throw stones at them. Um, but at the same time, they don't, they don't really even highlight YouTubers anymore unless they have some sort of corporate angle they can spin them, you know, and so unless there's some kind of teacher's pet that they can commodify, you know, here, put some of this makeup on or use this product, blah, blah, blah. So I don't actually know. Um, I just, I, I think if they could just get back to I, but I don't even trust them to promote creator. Cause every time I look at creator on the ride the last four years, I'm like, what is this? I don't, I, it's just all the same stuff. 
It's all just this vapid commentary about makeup or vapid commentary about pop culture. It's like we already have this in spades. Can we see something a little different, you know? Uh, uh, we have, so Guy Rose says, we have hundred, like hundreds of fasts, but they're not for cleansing purpose. They're more of a deed and reward kind of arrangement. Okay, so it's kind of like doing a tapas and you get a boon. Is it that kind of thing? Like you're doing it for a boon? See, I mean, even in, even that, I think that it's a similar sort of scenario. I mean, it's um, maybe it's more, maybe it's more if then. But it, I mean, if you think of the whole idea of what a, a fast or a renunciation is, like you're trying to sacrifice one thing so that you can have fill up that vacuum with something that you believe is more important and you know i keep thinking of that i i don't know who did the this study but the and this is apocryphal i'm not sure 100 percent if anyone wants to double check on this but i'd heard that they're like did this uh experiment with rats and the ones that were addicted to some substance uh, if they were alone they'd basically stay in that addiction until it almost killed them but if they brought a community of rats in um Oh, that's that was it. Uh, if they brought the food back in, the thing that they actually needed, they wouldn't go to it. But if they brought a community back in, even though they were still addicted to the old substance, because they had food and this community, it, they weren't as compelled to do that. And I think isolation, which is very is very easily accomplished through, you know, with the internet and all the things that we great tools, but when they become the crutch. Uh, it's pretty easy for us to feel isolated and it's pretty f easy for us to indulge in all this consumer addiction, you know, that, uh, so I, th I think the best thing to do, in my opinion, is not to just cut things out, but to put something in. And that was kind of the whole point of that, that rat, uh, experiment was to show if, r if rats have something else to do and other, uh, community to collaborate with in their own rat way, I guess, you know, to communicate with and have some sort of camaraderie, then the uh, alluring addiction doesn't seem as alluring. Um, I think one of the problems for us in consumer culture from here to India and beyond and back again is that so much of our con culture, so much of our community is tied around consumption. So we're all addicted to the same things. Like, you know, we binge watch Stranger Things. Um, for 4th of July. And, and, you know, I mean, sometimes like it's been a lot of hard, hard work since that hurricane hit us. And so I felt good just to sit down and do nothing. Um, but like, I just want to find a way to move from just consuming it to, to like take one idea and like, mm, that's, that's kind of interesting idea. One little part of something and maybe use that to spin off. If you think about the old uh, classical music guys, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, Bach, all these guys, uh, Tchaikovsky, he did a Romeo and Julio, Juliet overture. So he took a piece of art, turned it into music. Uh, and that happened all the time. There was all kinds of plagiarism and referencing and intellectual property, what? I mean, it's just people taking an idea, a musical motif, and they put it into their, their piece of music, and then they do this riff on it They're like they do a fantasy they call it a fantasia you know basically they take this musical theme and then they develop it and do all kinds of weird stuff with it um so i'm trying to take that kind of mentality like if there's something that inspires me in a piece of pop culture or music or whatever can i make something so i wrote a song this week um and i'm trying to i'm just trying to because music is, is basically the starting point for my brain and it's not the most creative stuff in the world, but it's it makes for at least decent soundtrack music for, for this kind of stuff, for video stuff. And then from there, try to see where I can take it. Because really what I want to do is make films in the long run. That's, that's what I want to do. And so if I can find a way, and film and music go hand in hand. So if I can find a way to be inspired by something I see, write a song that doesn't have any you know copyright tie to the inspiration, um, they can't, it's like, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, but, 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 uh, Black Sabbath, uh, they did Iron Man, you know, and that's a reference to Iron Man, the, the comic book character, but they didn't have to get like copyright for that because it's, it's like a, 
I don't know, music can kind of get away with that stuff. So, and, and so it, in it, and there was a big circle, you know, it's like, uh, Black Sabbath liked the comic book Iron Man, made a song Iron Man, and then, uh, next thing you know, uh, they're using that 20 years later as the soundtrack for the end of the first Iron Man movie. So, like, there are ways to, I think, be creative and kind of treat the things we consume almost like fertilizer or compost pile for our own creative efforts. So I think there's precedent for that in the history of art and music and, and uh, film. Why not cr start crowdfunding for Holly Bolly? I've noticed in comments there's a lot of demand for it from your viewers. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't have any faith in it, to be honest. I mean, the last one I put up, it got less than a thousand views. I mean, what? I mean, are those all thousand of those people going to pay a dollar? Like if they, if all thousand of those people would pay a dollar, yeah, I'd do it. But I just, you know, I, I put a lot into that and I've not made, I have not made anything. I've lost money on pretty much every video series I've ever done. So at this point, it's like, if I'm going to do something, I want to do something I believe in. And I don't think I'm the best comedian in the world. I think I'm a better, uh, writer in embryo and you know i don't think i'm the best writer in the world by any stretch of the imagination but i would like to write uh to hone my thinking better so that i could make my own films rather than just parodying other people's again like it's just it's kind of a lesser art form what's the point i mean i've had mil movies i want to m make before i went to india i've got this entire trailers in my head for these things and so i'd like to get to the point where i can make those um, I don't really watch too much, uh, anime, uh, Pumpkin King. Uh, my daughters introduced me to Cowboy Bebop. I'm, you know, 20 years behind the times. Is it 20 at this point or is it? Yeah, I guess it's about 20 years behind the times. Uh, I've really liked, I've really liked it a lot. Like we just finished this one episode. Um, it was the one called Scratch in which the, oh man, I, that movie to me was David Cronenberg's video drone had a baby with Philip K. Dick's uh, Ubik. That is good stuff. And they crammed it into 30 minutes. It's so good. Uh, Sharia says, the bot is still broken and it is sad. Those 10 seconds cost the whole revenue of the video. Fair use is being used and abused by these corporate regimes. Absolutely. Yep. That's correct. That's, that's correct. That's correct with Universal Music Group. It's correct with T-Series. Um, and yeah, content creators are, are just... It's not YouTube anymore. Lokesh, how are you doing? Uh, doing pretty well. The Pumpkin King capitalism. Eh, it's not capitalism. That's just crony. It's just cronyism. There's there's a, a difference. Like capitalism is is a machine. Uh, what you put in the machine can be uh, good, bad, or neutral. And most of what we put into it is neutral to bad. Most of what we put into it. People just you know stealing other people's stuff but they can get away with it because they have accountants and lawyers and and tons of money and throwing it in and it's just this you know this positive feedback loop of self-indulgence and that's uh what Harsh Joshi he mentioned one time in a Brett Weinstein talk that me and Judah talked about uh improbable one says what are ways around corporate bs are they end up being a part of it I've yet to see an example that worked around corporate BS without ending up being a part of the system. Yeah, that's right. And we were, I was talking with uh, a buddy last night about politics in America. And I know it's you know, a similar problem in India where uh, even if you go in with this idealism and you got this, you know, you want to do this big thing and change things and, and maybe fight uh, for the rights of the people you represent in your own area because they don't, they're not the same. You know, in a, if they're in a rural area, they don't have the same concerns and problems and and conflicts and dilemmas that people in the city face. So you're going from there to the big city and you want to represent them. But then they come in with this. They, they always find a way to get you. And I think he was saying that one of the things people uh, make a mistake about is they assume that everyone is just super corrupt and they're getting paid off. But a lot of the times, it's they are smarter than that. They come up with another deal. It's like, hey, we've got this great bill uh, that's going to, you know, this great new law that's going to help protect the people in your area against blank. 
and it's a legit problem, right? And so we just need your help on this other thing. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. You know, I'll be, you know, it's like I, I have to give up this other thing I want to fight for. So they, they get you to compromise just little bit by little bit. And again, just kind of fuse yourself in with the Borg collective, you know. It's just like give a little bit so that you can get something else done. You know, it's always just this little, you know, you scratch my back, I will scratch um, your people's back. See, it's not even for you, it's for them. And so they come with that kind of thing. And then it's hard to say no, because then it's like, you know, then they can attack you. If you say no, they can attack you to your, the people you represent and say, hey, look, he's such an idealist. He didn't actually care about you in this issue. And if you've paid any attention to the population, uh, people are puppets. Like you, you can make up a story that's not real on Twitter, uh, get it hashtag trending this is happening right now. And everyone erupts into this giant debate about something that is totally made up or, you know, they get five people out of a billion and they take those five people and say, it's a movement. Look at all these people complaining about this thing. Look at all these Nazis. Look at all these KKK members. Look at all these whatever. And they take those five people and they make them infamous. And then everyone's like, look at this terrible... And it's like stati the knowledge of statistics goes out the window. That's like one one millionth of a percentage of the population. But we're going to talk about those five people and we're going to make public policy about it. And we're going to all have to talk about it on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube for the next two weeks. Uh, so people, that's how people get compromised. Because like if that guy who goes to Washington or to uh, New Delhi and he's all idealistic, and he's trying to represent his people. And then the powers that be come along and say, hey, you know, we got this deal. And if you don't, do it well then you're you're betraying your people and that's they can play it like that and people will buy it people buy that crap all the time you know it's like oh well he didn't represent us i mean man, i mean that kind of stuff just happens all the time i've witnessed it since the hurricane so everyone's desperate because the hurricane hit us and they want god to come and save them and so they start praying to the government like well, we need we need relief we need this we need that <sighs> And so, and, and it doesn't matter. Like, you know, they could pass a law, a law like, again, like our, our politics are so far behind. They'll try to pass this giant law and it has like 80,000 things in that law. And one of the things happens to say, we're going to give money to the people who've been affected by Hurricane Michael. And then on some, on page 85 in the fine print, it says, and by the way, um, we're going to come and uh, take over your local uh, post office and only use it for the military. I mean, something obscure and absurd, just ridiculous. Like you would never ex expect them them to need. It's just always these little things, these little insidious things they have in a footnote somewhere. And and so then a representative reads that and is like, well, I'm not signing my name to that. And everyone's like, oh, look at he hates the people who are affected by Hurricane Michael. It's just, I mean, people people are not stupid. A person, oh, this is men in black. A person is not stupid, but people are dumb, panicky, and stupid. As soon as, as soon as things get to the mainstream level and we're just talking, you know, sound bites. People just react. We just all react. You know, it's, oh, someone said that. It's like, no, someone didn't even say it. Someone photoshopped that. Like, I think with some of this technology, maybe it'll make people think a little more once deep fakes, we're getting to the point where deep fakes and CG is getting good enough. Like smart people got duped on Twitter a few weeks ago. And by um, Corridor Dig Digital, they made a mock video of Boston Dynamics, you know, those robots. And they made a mock video showing these technicians hitting these uh, robots and the robots were fake. They were CG. And like the tagline was, "Our they're going to remember this, our future robot overlords. And, uh, and all these people, smart people, shared it thinking that it was real. Didn't even, didn't even like cross check it one time. And when, when people called them on it, again, not like some country bumpkin moron, but some Silicon Valley tech guy shares this video and someone calls him on it. It's like, dude, that is a parody. Those are CG robots. They're not real robots. Uh, like, well, I'm sure it's going to happen soon anyway. 
What? I mean, just there's just so much sentiment, sentiment and hysteria on the internet. It's crazy. Uh, we need a new YouTube and Facebook, Ian Cassidy. If someone made something, I would run away. What do you think about Bit Shoot? Um, that has been recommended to me. Uh, I am keeping it in mind. For now, I'm just I'm just really focused on the podcast at this point and using whatever platforms I can. But I just I just get tired of, uh, you know, we we had a big donation from somebody and just seeing YouTube take thirty five percent off the top of it for no reason. It's like the government takes twenty already. Like, I mean, I you know it just it just gets absurd at a certain point. I don't I don't, I don't get it. Um, best filmmaker very soon. That's very kind of you, Crime Master Gogo. Uh, it's not gonna be very soon. Let's 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 be, let's be moderate about this ambition. About ten years out. <laughs> can you can we hang out when I come to the U.S.? I don't even know who you are, Crime Master Gogo. Do do I actually know? Have you been catfishing me the whole time? As and you're one of my friends. I still don't know. Yes, I would love to hang out with you. You've been a viewer of the channel for like five years. Akash, uh, maybe longer than that. Uh, long time no see. Yes, it has been long. Uh, Sharia, do you reckon that the view to subscriber count is because of the frequency that, you, uh, that you're used to upload? Yeah. Well, that and also the, just the change in content. I can't blame anybody. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's my fault uh, mainly. It's also a bit YouTube's fault, to be honest. <laughs> like, uh, they did not. Uh, like, I, I was the, I introed Conan Gill and uh, Biswa uh, at whatever YouTube, I think it was 2015 YouTube uh, Fan Fest in Mumbai. Like, me and Trouble Seeker team, we, in, like, we were the intro to the Master of Cer Ceremonies. We were up on stage. And so, like, at that point, I only had, like, 15 or 20,000 subs. And I thought, like, I, I wasn't expecting to be a household name. I wasn't expecting to host YouTube Fan Fest the next year or anything. But I was expecting to have a place. And they just, I said something in one of these meetings, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what I did. There was one time they invited me and I did a, and I did a little talk uh, at one of these local YouTube meetups at the Google offices. And I think I said something then that just pissed them off I don't know I, I, I probably said some, I don't know what I said but that's, it's supposed to be YouTube and you know that's what I um, I, I am thankful that YouTube hasn't like deplatformed H3 because uh, H3 will call YouTube battle and bull crap quite a bit um, but you know I don't know you, get, you can't just have a you can't have like an individualist sort of, that to me is just so stupid you can't have an individualist libertarian mindset or and cap or or you know just even if you're not into any of those things like an anarchist or or just just being an individualist you can't even just have that on you freak you on youtube you can't have it I, just call it status quo tube just just call it pay your master tube um well i mean, sorry, I, I mean i got a job now it doesn't just take time to make these things. It's a matter of me having a family and and a job and no, well, that's I mean <laughs> Okay. Ian says create the illusion of limited resources and scarcity due to a mismanagement of the ecosystem and technology, and then separate different groups of people based off of different reasons. Oh interesting. I'm trying to follow that train of thought. Oh, I see. Okay, create the illusion of limited resources and scarcity. Oh man, I love, man. I'm, I'm quoting you on that one, dude. I love that. That is fantastic. Um, well put. I think I'm gonna RT you on that one. Uh, yeah, that's what I feel like. Pretty much every place I've. I've worked every place in every sort of market, uh, creating the illusion of limited resources uh, because they're mismanaging. <laughs> I felt like I've been working in a factory since I've got, I've worked multiple jobs since I got back from India. And uh, I seemed like every one of them, mismanagement of the ecosystem, that just mismanagement of the ecosystem instead of YouTube broadcasters of us YouTube mismanagement of the ecosystem that's it like that is that is perfect pithy way of describing all the frustrations I've had like here 
we live in what we call the Redneck Riviera. So this is like, uh, it's it's kind of a crude thing. It's kind of it's kind of making fun of, you know, the the local country population, right? And at heart, I'm a redneck. Like, just it's like a country bumpkin, you know. Um, and but they call us the Redneck Riviera because it's like trying to be, I don't know, kind of uppity, like good place for people to come and vacation. But really, we're just a bunch of white trash and so it's a redneck riviera right um so around here we have a joke and we call it the good old boy system and i feel like in india an analogous way of putting it would be to say something like uh what would you call it uh like babu culture it's kind of like the clerk who's just it doesn't matter if he does a good job or not he's just always going to be there because you know it's that you know, do you know who my dad is sort of mentality. It's like a combination of those two things. It's basically like I'm subsidized no matter how bad a job I do here. So it is it is what it is. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Then tell each group that it's the other people's fault. Oh, man, that's dude. <laughs> and, yeah, you're on it. That's, exact, that's exactly it. Tell each group that it's the other people's fault. Make the uh, different departments fight against each other. Yeah, that, that's about it. At a boy, thank you for watching on Twitch. I'm just uh, talking with viewers. I'm about to dive into the uh, essay. Uh, guy wrote, "May be the overambitious is to bring capsizing changes is the root fault in us. Maybe nano grassroot changes are enough for an individual. Yet in the acu accumulation, that might be a big change. Uh, yeah, you're 100 percent right, and that is my big problem. I don't. If you watched the video I uploaded, like that was one of me jumping the shark. I'm starting this new video series. Uh, and the first one I upload, I say some like most controversial things I've said on the channel in 10 years. Uh, it's typical me. I'm just an idiot. I, you know, um, yeah, it's like if I'm, I don't be careful here, I'm going to be branded as like the middle brow pseudo intellectual Alex Jones. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's better to do small changes. Uh, gradualism is better than punctuated equilibrium. We don't have any we don't have any control over punctuated equilibrium, you know, but we can make gradual changes slowly over time. And I, I think you're absolutely right. So I, I like that. Man, y'all are like, like, tell me, tell me what y'all Twitter's handle handles. I'm going to like tweet you both Ian and uh, Gyro. If you don't mind doxing yourself. Um, Cause those are both really good. And that's exactly what I need to do. Uh, I just now searched deep fake. Now I can make my lifelong dream of becoming Logan Paul come true. So to answer your question, I'm Logan Paul. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Crime Master Gogo, you make, you make it happen. Seven years. Wow. It's been a long time. 2012. You were the, you were here since 2012. That's impressive because there was like 800 people here back then. That's that's really good. Of course, now there's only 800 people. <laughs> now there's like 13. So, I mean, you're the, you're the real deal. Any idea when you will reach 60,000 subs? I'm not going to reach 60,000 subs. <laughs> not until I start doing something more popular. Um, yeah, I've got to make some changes. And, I, you know, I think what Gyro is saying there. Uh, so, I think uh, if if I could make these just slow changes over time to some of my film ideas, just do like a shot a week or something like that. Uh, I might be able to get somewhere in a few years. I've got to do that. And that's, that's why the new surfing violinist hypothesis sign off is, uh, God be with you on your quest for consistency, kismet, non-zero sum creativity. If you're an atheist, just think about like that, uh, you know, that, that ideal out in front of you, like you're moving towards like the mountain, you know, or, or whatever it is, the horizon, you know, it's just like that transcendent ideal, that thing that you want to make real. That's just right now, some kind of pl platonic thing. Like it's not, it doesn't have real form, you know? So, I mean, you can think of it like that, just trying to uh, move towards that. But consistency is the first part. And that's the thing I'm worst about. I mean, y'all see this and I, I, and, you know, it's like Sharia said earlier, like I just, I've been very inconsistent over the years and I don't do one type of video and I'll get tired of that and I'll do another type of video and get tired of that. So, uh, consistency is, is key. Uh, Aditya, I'm doing fine. I'm doing pretty good. Are Indians welcome where I live? Of course they're welcome where I live. 
man, see, I'm telling you, like the media makes America look like it's some friggin' come on, man. Yes, Indians are welcome here. We'll show you. Uh, we'll show you some. What's that? I was bragging about it. I uh, work with uh, a Mexican guy. We're both we're doing some demolition stuff. And uh, he was asking me, he's from Mexico City, so he doesn't get to see the beaches in Mexico that much. He was asking me how our beach is here, and I was bragging about him. Like, oh, man, they're so amazing. Just wait till you get out there. It's, we got this beautiful sand. got this beautiful blue water. It looks like you're in Indonesia or Fiji. And he gets out there, and there was seaweed. And he came back. He's like, oh, the beach is nice. This beach is nice. I was like, was the water good? He's like, not really. <laughs> I was like, man, geography, yeah. Uh, like making me look uh, like I'm lying. Jante hey mera bap kohon hey yeah that's that's the one. Uh, Ian says I lived in Gainesville for 12 years, so I get you. Um, do we have worse than our previous generation? In in relation to what? Oh, we got a bits, fuchi glip glops. Thank you for the bits. Godspeed. Appreciate it. Fuchi glip glops. That's that's good. That's good. Um, Improbable one said, JPP makes people ask that question when someone cries too much about how bad we get it now. What do you think of us having worse or better than our previous generations? Yes, you're, you're right. I mean, if we're really honest, uh, things are way better. Like in, in that video I made, you know, it's, it's, I even talked about how net violence is down. No matter what your, whatever your hot button is, whether it's war, uh, famine, uh, you know, controversial issues like abortion, like whatever it is, it's, it's not as bad as it was a thousand years ago where, I mean, it's almost like, um, there's something in us that just needs to keep like artificial death a part of the cycle because we're just not used to having people. Uh, it's, it's the Thanos situation, really. Like we we kind of deep down believe in eugenics because we, we don't we've never experienced this before in history. Like we, this kind of medical uh, progress, and there's a lot of us would probably be dead, you know, in a previous generation like a thousand years ago or 15, we just wouldn't have made it, you know, wouldn't have made it as a knight, wouldn't have made it through famine, wouldn't have made it through the black plague or the pestilence, the red death, whatever, like, you know, black death, I guess what it's called. Um, you know, just think about so many things that now are just like a common cold, but back then just would kill you. Um, so I think a lot of that, uh, we do have a lot to be thankful for. And it's just, it's hard to remember because I think, and I've said this in a previous podcast, uh, I think existential dread, um, the reason why that really came on the scene uh, with some of these these philosophers, you know, you read something like Camus or uh, Sartre, uh, there's, there's just this feeling of disconnected, uh, like dread, you know, where you just, and you can see it sometimes in our movies. And, and I think we, f I feel it. I just feel it a lot. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm Something else. Um, and sometimes that just feels worse than physical pain. It just feels bad. <laughs> okay, Fuji Glip Glops asks, where's the France? All right, I'm going to do my France here. Um, the family is good, Prabhat. I'm okay, I'm going to go ahead and do today's essay. No Judah with me today, so just me. Okay. Today's essay here, I'll include the link. Do hick if you want to follow along. I didn't go into Facebook. I don't know if anybody's watching on Facebook or not. Okay, so today's essay is something I've said before on this channel. Uh, if you've been a long-time viewer, I think I, this made it in a previous live stream or a previous video. Um, but it's pretty much an answer that I already had uh, built in to to my whole building a better me ideal uh, before Judah asked the question. You know, because we got all these rants, these Ford rants about, uh, you know, let's 
quit sucking up to the state, quit doing th business the same old way, quit letting religion you know, pull you by the, the neck around, like, like actually act, you know? Um, but Judah has gotten, I think it's a bit like, okay, all this sounds great and idealistic, but how do we do that? How do we move from point A to point Z? And so I think this is my attempt at getting what Guy Rose talking about to, to just move the needle a little bit at a time, just take one little tiny step at a time. So on creativity, consumption, and capital in the information age. Most of us have been lulled into passive consumption as the default state of humanity in the information age. If your input-output ratios tend to zero, then try to increase your output incrementally. The haters will come out of the woodwork and tell you you're wasting your time. In a sense, they will be right. Your output won't be good at first. But if you leverage the hater feedback as constructive criticism and refine and iterate, you will start to uncover what really interests you creatively, not just passively. Shoot low. Just try to get your online output to equal one-tenth of your input. Ten to one input-output ratio is better than ten to zero. As you increase and refine the quality and quantity of your output, you will begin... begin to realize that much of the input you've considered invaluable isn't all that great. You'll start being more picky about your input and start trying to align your input with the interests that define your output. Next thing you know, you'll be craving less input that is purely passive, entertaining, and binge-worthy, and more input that is constructive to your creative goals. I think some people read this and, and think this is all hypo hypothetical, but I did live like this for some period of time, especially when I was in India. I mean, I was doing five to seven videos a week at certain points, which is no small feat for a single channel. The goal here is to move from input that is comfortable to creatively challenging, to move from catharsis that makes you feel better about how bad the world is to a catalyst to change you to make the world a better place. From catharsis to catalyst, from escapism to edification. So edification is old school, fancy religious word, basically just means building up. This is not an overnight process by any means, but the transformation from information consumer to information curator and craftsman will be worth it. The evolution of information sharing can be thought of like this. The king, the priest, and the scribe controlled the flow of information for thousands of years. Not so much out of a dictatorial inclination, but as more as a result of technological necessity. With the printing press, this class-based information distribution system was disrupted. The power of the king, priest, and scribe was irrevocably undermined, or so it would seem. But then came the machines. To some degree, Marx was right about the way in which industrial technology cordoned off access to the means of production in a new technocratic class system. Those with access to expensive equipment began to repair the class-based system of information control through machines. Kings were replaced by media mogul corporations like Hearst Murdoch or book publishers. Scribes were replaced by industrial printing presses. And priests were replaced by pundits, journalists, editors, think tanks, professors, and authors. With the industrialization of the printing press, Gutenberg's peer-to-peer -peer disruption was captured by both capital and regulation. The irony of newspapers' tendency towards socialism should be recognized here. The newspaper in its very existence is a crony capitalist enterprise that cordons off the means of information production and distribution from the proletariat. The internet and the World Wide Web come along. Two innovations socialists should love access to the means of production and distribution in one package. Well, what do newspapers do? Start a new class war, mocking bloggers as the know-nothing proletariat. How bourgeois. And I wrote this like a year and a half ago. That is so true on Twitter. You'll have blue check accounts that will make fun of people that have more, more Twitter followers than them. They'll make fun of them. Because they believe in this old school class war. They believe that they have, they have, they have their tenure. They're an official journalist, quote-unquote. That makes them a higher species. Now the governments of the world and the kings, priests, and scribes of the media want to do everything they can to keep you from realizing the power you have with this technological marvel we call the Internet. But they're smart enough to realize that a direct 1984-style crackdown will not work. Huxley's brave new world provides a better strategy. Keep us glued to consumption through our eyes, ears, bellies, and pleasure centers. In the brave new World Wide Web, you are being lulled into passive consumption. Make no mistake, this is a class war. The producers are enslaving you and I through comfortable consumption. 
It is a Stockholm syndrome so pleasant it will escape the notice of even the most stubborn individualist. This strategy is nothing new. The most effective way to enslave a population is through pleasurable dependence. Therefore, the sage, in the exercise of his government, empties their minds, fills their bellies, weakens their wills, and strengthens their bones. The Tao Te Ching 3.3. The faux Marxists realized that the best way to enslave the proletariat was not by outlawing, outlawing the means of production, but by making them think that this technology is a one-way tool, a means of consumption. The consumption class can win, but this will require everyone to wean ourselves off of the pleasure dome and begin using the internet as access to the means of the production and distribution of information instead of as a glorified television. And that's my big rant about YouTube right now. It's supposed to be a production and distribution platform and it has become TV guide for crying out loud. TV guide. Oh, good grief. You know what a TV guide is in America? It is a stupid little magazine that was at the, the supermarket. You're checking out, going through the store, there's this TV guide and it tells you what to watch on TV. You know, it's got all the, the lists, a print-based publication. That's what YouTube has become. A TV guide in 2019, that is such an outmoded architecture. It's so stupid. When I was at YouTube Fan Fest, I can't remember if it was 2015 or 2016, but they had, oh man, I wish I'd have recorded this. I'm going to see if I can find the footage. This drives me up the wall. I wish I could call this person out. It was some older lady in tech. And she sat there and talked about how YouTube, she saw YouTube's potential. This is how she saw YouTube's potential, y'all. And this is when everything started going downhill for YouTube. This is what she saw YouTube as. Seventeen Magazine. She saw it as a teeny bopper magazine for girls to know what type of makeup to put on. How is that empowering for women? How is that empowering for young girls? I keep hearing this crap. How is it empowering for young girls telling you them their face looks like shit and they have to cake something on? I'm sorry. What's the feminist message there? Excuse me? And you are, you are taking one of the most powerful distribution platforms the world has ever known. You're talking, always talking about women need to break the glass ceiling in tech. And then you're, but you're still selling them this outmoded, stupid 17 magazine, a magazine, you want YouTube to become that? And she was delivering this in India, you guys. She was delivering this in India. Just so out of touch with reality. Like her baby boomer mind couldn't imagine that maybe this thing could be used to teach people to code, you know? To actually do something constructive. To make films. But no, let's, let's sit here and sell products for Madison Avenue. That was the limit of her vision. Really, really forward thinking there, Miss Feminist. The, the consumption class can win, but this will require everyone to wean ourselves off of the pleasure dome and begin using the internet as access to the means of the production and distribution of information instead of as a glorified television. <laughs> I just had to say it again. The die is cast, the individual has won. The revolution Gutenberg ushered in with the printing press over a half a millennium ago has just begun. You want to join a movement? Then make your own. Use the internet as it was intended. The kings, scribes, and priests of the old information empire will concoct every manner of petty sights, pretty sights and sounds to keep you tethered to the system. But as you move from 10 to 0 input to output ratio to 1 to 1, you won't miss them. So, thoughts. Bomb, diggy, bomb, bomb. Good to see you. Five videos a week. <laughs> I make 10,000 TikTok videos every day. I can't keep up with that stuff, man. See, I am old school. Like, I'm sitting here complaining about this baby boomer and her 17 magazine. Um, but I cannot keep up with that those five-second video things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm an old man. Jacob George says, hey, man, I don't have time to hang around. But just wanted to say I really enjoy your videos and I hope you're doing well. But thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, doing I'm doing well. <laughs> you know, good good front to get the the blood moving. Um Bomb Doogie Bomb Bomb. F YouTube, they're thieves. But I don't know if you've heard this Bomb Doogie Bomb Bomb, but I fully demonetized my channel. They're not making money off of me no more until they make some concessions. Uh actually they are still gonna make money off me because some of the actually almost all of the Holly Bolly videos 
uh, y'all were mentioning earlier, uh, almost all of them are monetized at this point and I get no revenue. So, you know, Rithik is getting his like 1,000th of a, of a Pesa uh, royalty check from my, from my Chris 3 trailer. Yeah, he really needed that 1,000th of a Pesa there. Let's, let's, let's make sure we get that to him. Uh, you, uh, Ian says YouTube grew because we wanted genuine content, but is moving more and more streamlined corporate content. Yep. Uh, thank you, BLF. Oh! 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 Snap! <laughs> Dire Code Vincent says, "Feminists just want to be, not to do." So I've been talking about on this podcast a lot how we call ourselves human beings. I I want us to call ourselves human actors. I've known incredibly smart women who act. And I've also been in a lot of business scenarios where people are just content to be, you know, that you get together for the corporate meeting and it's just everyone patting each other on the back on how good, how good they are. It's just total sentimentality. You know, I'm sorry. I don't go back and read Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and get sentiment. I just don't. I don't see Elizabeth Bennett as this sentimental person. You, oh, everything's fine. You know, we get, you know, for the Jane Bennett. For the feminists out there who like this kind of stuff, for the Jane Bennett, who is that kind of woman, there's Elizabeth Bennett, who's more complex and actually acts and doesn't just sit around and pat everyone on the back and everything's just an expression session about how things are bad and oh, my feelings are hurt. But I mean, that's a corporate executive was speaking to corporate people at YouTube India saying that kind of thing. We just need to have a little bit of pal around. But, and it's, it's not constructive though, because you're saying, these girls need to be educated by Madison Avenue. Not even, not even Mumbai. Be educated from ad exec, Mad Men for crying out loud. Like, I thought, I thought feminists hated Mad Men, but that's the people you, the, the power that you're giving. Hey, you don't look good enough. You need to wear this. And you need to do this. I don't understand how that's empowering. I mean, isn't Elizabeth Bennett more empowering than this just mod molly coddling sort of like everyone's okay, I'm okay, you're okay, let's just all sit around and and watch stuff together and watch these superstars up on the screen? I mean, really, YouTube now, every day I go to the trending tape, every day, it's makeup, late night talk show hosts, and women's soccer, and... uh music that's not good like that's it's all it is every time it's the same thing there's like never there's never a diversity of music it's always just hip-hop mumble rap boring <laughs> fuji clip clop says let's sneeze on door handles and bring back some sort of plague uh no <laughs> Bob Dicky Bob, I was about to send one thousand dollars in super chat, but I've deleted super chat. Aniket says, "I hope you're doing great. Don't you think American media has just exaggerated the recent USA Iran conflict? Absolutely, absolutely. It's just exaggeration is the name of the game, man. It's always exaggeration, all the time. Uh, yeah, just a hundred percent. Oh, d I, I, I actually don't know the particulars of that particular India." conflict a couple months ago I was kind of kind of like what dude, honestly I'm here in America and I just totally tuned that whole thing out it's like what the drone got shot it's whatever I'm you know I'm whatever like I can't trust things these news sources anymore I just feel like they're constantly trying to like make a mountain out of molehill of, out of every single little thing I mean <laughs> the most recent one about I'm not even gonna talk about it okay so how do we practically do this how do we move like Gyro was talking about earlier, how do we move from A to Z? How do we do this incremental slow over time? So I'm talking about just trying to make our, make our input output more balanced. Um, for the longest time, this has happened. I can't remember within the first one, first time I did this. I honestly think it was Cowboys and Aliens. I watched Cowboys and Aliens with Melissa. It was one of the first movie, first Western movies we saw. Uh, once we were in India, and not a particularly great movie, um, 
but I hadn't seen a Western movie in a while. And we got to, you know, get away, um, get away for a little bit. We had a uh, babysitter. Satu was pretty young at that point. And uh, so we got some time alone. We got to go watch this movie. And I remember, even though it's just, it's just a silly blockbuster comic book movie, I was inspired by something in it. There was, there was two things. And there was this a brief moment in the, in the score, you know, the musical score, soundtrack. And I loved it. Like, it was just this little five seconds. And I was like, man, it made me want to pick up my violin. And then not long after that, uh, X-Men First Class came out. And, yeah, is that right? X-Men First Class. And Magneto's theme, Michael Fassbender. Magneto's theme, just, uh, I fell in love with it. I just thought it was, I'm just from a violin playing perspective. I used to play in symphony orchestras. Uh, it just put me there. And so I went, I came home and I covered it and I made this oh, God awful video, man. It's just so bad. I, I like, I green screen myself in with all the people and golly, the, the sound is terrible. Oh, like I can't even go back and watch that thing. It's oh, so bad. Um, but the, the quality of, of the uh, types of recording devices we have now, just in five years has gone through the roof. It's almost like exponential how much better things are. Um, and so we had a very generous uh, viewer of the channel, uh, the Indian dude. He, he got, us an, got me an iPad and, uh, and this one little mic. It's a little Shure mic that you can plug right into the iPad. I record, so uh, this week, uh, this was, I mean, he got that a long time ago because GarageBand is just, it's an easy thing for me to use to kind of put things together. And so all the soundtrack stuff you've heard on my channel is through GarageBand app for iPad, $5 app. Um, and so we watched Midsummer this week and that movie just, uh, I don't know, like sometimes movies, I, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a film geek. Uh, like I'm, I'm, I can be very film critical and, you know, artsy fartsy stuff, but I, I like, I just like movies until I read a criticism of it. I will, I will come away from almost any movie, almost any movie, even bad ones. And I'll come away and say, oh, I really like that one thing. And for me, even though the whole is less than the sum of the parts, like that one part was worth it for me. Um, so Midsummer got me thinking about something I haven't thought in a while. It's a very controversial video. I am not saying that Ari Aster, the director of Midsummer, uh, is saying what I'm saying in that video. You can go watch it. I won't really talk about it. But I got, uh, I was driving home from work. Uh, we'd, we'd seen it at night. And the thing, my takeaway from the film was it's really about grief and uh, not being able to breathe with anxiety. And I've felt that a lot, like t being able to, not being able to take a breath, you know, just, just feeling so anxious. And that movie is all about depression and mourning and not being able to breathe and finally being able to take a breath. And uh, I, I have never watched a horror movie that I, I honestly get, I've watched the video I've made about it and it ends with this one shot where the main character is a woman um, who... Florence Pugh is her name, the actress. Dude, I just thought she was god tier. I, I liked her performance better than uh, Tony Collette, to be honest, in Hereditary. Because to me, she just got this feeling. I, I think a lot of dudes watch it. Uh, not to be the, I'm sorry for being the weepy feminist here, but a lot of dudes watch it and just think, oh, she's annoying. Like, oh, she's just so, so entitled and blah, blah, blah. I, everything she did, I understood because I saw it from the depression morning side. And uh, I just have been there where people just tell you, oh, come on, it's not a big deal. Oh, come on, everything's gonna be okay. And they don't let you breathe and they don't let you mourn out loud. So she has to keep going away. She has to go to the bathroom in order to mourn, you know? And just she's just crying like silently. And uh, uh, so anyways, this, this stuff was just percolating in my head all night long. And so I went to work. I was coming back home. Uh, Tom York has released a new album, and he was interviewed. And I've, I don't think I've ever seen a Tom York interview. The ones I've seen of him, he's just Radiohead, the guy from the lead singer of Radiohead. Uh, my favorite band. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm a, I'm a hipster. Uh, but uh, he he gave this pretty open interview, and he just some of some of the things he said about his creative process just 
it just lit the fire under me. I was like, I, I got to do something. I'm going to do something tonight. And I got on the porch right outside and I recorded that whole thing on the porch outside. And uh, it just, I don't know. It was like, a, it, it was based on the movie, basically. Um, and it, uh, it felt like a re- release of a lot of this angst that's in me, right? <clears throat> and again, that's not, that's not like the end goal, right? Like just some half-ass recording. It's like, you know, back in the days, I think like rock stores, they would, they would have, they would get an idea when they're at a bar. And so there's a lot of these napkin stories. And some of these you find at Rockstar Hall of Fame or Hard Rock Cafes, they're just a napkin and they'd jot down some lyrics. And so for me, GarageBand has been my napkin. And uh, I feel like what my goal in this next year through this podcast is, is to share some of this music with you guys. Uh, and gals and and at a certain point in the future be able to cannibalize that to something better you know maybe like maybe this is the raw materials of some actual work of art like I don't think any of this stuff is really a work of art it's just it's more uh well kind of like this podcast it's a frant it's a frant and artistic like sort of uh, channel and if we can take that and then make something coherent with it and so the coherent thing I want to make one day uh, I'm just, I'm my mentally, I'm just still not there, uh, because I'm, I'm, when it comes to finished violin playing and finished filmmaking, I'm a perfectionist, and y'all, y'all haven't really seen that side of me, because I just, I've just suppressed it, because I just don't have time to think about it. But uh, I think, I, I think if I could just get in the right headspace, and kind of like Gyro was talking about, just do a little bit at a time here and there, and then over a year. I've got a movie trailer and over a year I've got a song that's actually worth buying, you know? Um, so I will be doing these sort of like scratch tracks, uh, uploading to iTunes and stuff like that. So if anyone wants to support the channel, uh, you can buy those. And that's, that's one way to support the channel. Uh, it's, it is really a matter of support because they're not like hundred percent produced, but hopefully, hopefully some little melody or some lyric might be useful to you. Um, so that's kind of what my goal is. You know, when Judah's asking, what are we going to do about it? Like, well, let's start doing something. Let's just start doing something. I want to make the the real thing, two things outside of the music. So the music's my starting point because that's where I don't feel inhibited. Like when I get on GarageBand, I feel kind of free just to kind of mess around and just see what happens. Um, I want to take those melodies and have them inform like playable uh, like web-based web, like web game, basically. It's really simple, rudiment. It'd almost be like text-based or something. But when you go, come to my website, it's like, it's just like an old text game back from the 80s or something like that. You know, you, you're sitting at your desk and such and such happens. What do you want to do? I don't know, something like that. But it, like use use the tools that we have that are cheap and not hard to build to almost as raw materials for something better later. So like use uh, the internet almost as your storyboard, if that makes sense. So start with the soundtrack, uh, use the internet as your storyboard, like my website or Instagram or something, like use that as the storyboard. And then from there, make a trailer for movies that don't exist that are, uh, that I'd like to make one day. And it's like, then that can be, like an ad, basically. Would you like to see this made? Then subscribe, you know, and we can team up and try to make this thing a reality. Okay, I'll go back through the, so those are some of the ideas. Go back through some of the comments here. Oh, okay, Improbable One had asked me to watch Anand Gandhi's video. I will share the link to that here. I'll just put this in the, this has some of the links of stuff. I'm going to put this in the chat. Hopefully this should hit everybody. Uh, this has a link uh, to my essay and um, Anand Gandhi did this talk on why he's a filmmaker. He's the director, writer of Ship of Theseus. Um, I liked that movie a lot. Melissa liked that movie a lot. Melissa is not the biggest indie film fan, artsy fartsy stuff. I thought the movie was really good. Some people made fun of it, and then some people make fun of Anand Gandhi calling him pretentious. Um, I love this talk that he gave. 
about free will and determinism. Like, it actually brought a tear to my eye. He's, you have to get through it. The fur it sounds like he's talking a bunch of gobbledygook. You, you really just need to get through it. He's talking about a new little interesting wrinkle that helps him when he's facing life choices and he feels powerless. And it's his way of, of being able to choose free will, even though he doesn't even believe in it, uh, like ideologically. Um, you know, he feels biologically determined, but he chooses to act anyway. And I think that's, um, that kind of humbles you, you know, so that you're not like, I can do anything because that's me. You, you don't want to be like me. You do, you would rather be like Anand Gandhi. He, he's got a film, uh, an indie film that was actually successful. That's really hard to do in India or America or anywhere. It's hard to make an independent film that's, uh, that actually reaches an audience and recaps on its investment. <laughs> Uh, recoups on its investment. So I think it's a fantastic talk and I'm thankful to Improbable One for sharing it with us. Uh, I also got a link to the Tom York interview in there. And it was also kind of interesting um, like to hear one of my idols and some of the, his opinions on things that I patently disagree with and realize, oh, he's human too. We're all humans here. There's no gods among us in that sense, right? Like we all got room to grow and and things that we can work on so like quit being intimidated just start doing something just that but don't shoot so high that is my problem every time i shoot so high i swing for the fences my first video i'm gonna start doing these video essays um about films because i, I do want to get inspiration from prior films to kind of inform my future work i you know someone posted this this week on twitter that they had been working on a book they got 70 pages into this book no, 70,000 words, I'm sorry, 70,000 words into this book, and they found another book uh, that was written 15 years prior that said everything that he'd already said. I, I don't even know it was a book. It might have been an article. And people are trying to comfort him, like, oh, well, maybe your book has some different twists on it. And he's like, not really. <laughs> it's like I just wasted all this time writing 70,000 words. This guy's already answered the question. So one of the reasons why I'm going back to watch old films, quality films, is to just to make sure that I'm not retreading old territory. Um, but I'm trying to be real purposeful with the movies that I pick. And I'm trying to uh, do what I did like with the song. Like if I'm watching something, I need to write a post about it. You know, maybe it's not as creative as the film, but maybe it's something that can get us thinking towards being creative ourselves. Okay, the empowerment of women five four uh, five eight four six one eight eight. The empowerment of women includes empowering them to be able to become cultural cliches. The narrow categorization of feminism is just an extension of keeping women in a box. Yeah, it's the commodification. You know, I mean, it's the same thing, just repackaged. Like, uh, I mean, I feel like so many women suffrage uh, women, if they were here, seeing how all this is going down. I mean, it's just the same thing. If you had Che Guevara and Marx here now. Like, we like, wait, what? You call these people socialists or driving around a freaking Audi? <laughs> uh, what? Excuse me? Uh, Bomb Doobie Bomb Bob says, Sexy Phil is the only news source I trust. Now, I haven't seen Sexy Phil in a while. Um, he's always been a real YouTuber. I, I've really, I've respected him and his, I'm thankful he's still here, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I liked, I liked it. I, I, I like, uh, Anand Gandhi's movie. Oh, no, you're talking about Cowboys and Aliens. Yeah, no, I thought it was okay. You know, that's two different ends of the expression, uh, spectrum there, Cowboys and Aliens and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Anand Gandhi's movie. Uh, Lokesh says, how are you, mate? Mate, what's up? Um, I'm here. I'm doing good. <laughs> Fuchi Glub Glops, you're using too many napkins. Banana Cabana in the porch. I feel bored. Uh, it's good to see you all. So that's pretty much it for this week. Uh, do check out some of those links if you get a, if you get a chance to see on Gandhi's uh, interview. Or I mean, his uh, it's not it's like a TED talk is basically what it is, um, but for a different organization. And then Tom York's interview. If you're at all interested in Radiohead or or the songwriting process, he opened up a lot about it, and it was uh, it was real inspiring to me. It lit a fire under me. So next week, we're going to be talking about, um, I just have this right here. Uh, 
uh, I wrote an essay. And so this this kind of ties into what I'm, what I'm talking about. I wrote an essay on Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And it's, I wrote this little song that went along with the essay. Um, this will be the second video in that series I'm calling The Spoils. And it's basically just my stream of consciousness writing about stuff that has inspired me in art and film and music. And uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep just blew me away. The Blade Runner films are based on the book, uh, but the book goes in a just... Philip K. Dick is just... It's almost impossible to truly adapt. Like, you can make movies out of his stuff and they can get the, you know, this Gaussian blur of what he's trying to communicate. But man, that... Oh, man. It's just... It feels like a, a sledgehammer to the gut. It's so good. And so I wrote this piece of music for it. I really like the piece of music. Uh, I like it better than the one I wrote for Midsummer, And uh, so I'm going to try to actually put some words to that this week and see if I can, you know, just kind of keep this idea going. Just, again, thinking of this stuff almost like raw materials for some future idea. Um, kind of get slowly but surely towards the goal. Uh, and then... Another song, so I'd like to do a cover of Come On Up To The House, uh, like actually record inside. That's the song, I, the blues song by Tom Waits. And do it myself and put that up on iTunes. We'll start putting these things up on iTunes so patrons will get access to all this stuff for free. So you won't have to get it down on, on iTunes. Uh, anyone else who wants to support the channel but doesn't want to do it on a monthly basis, keep an eye out for some of these songs. Maybe you like them. If you do like them, like you know, a dollar here, a dollar there will be a way that you can support the podcast. All right, so everyone, thank you all for showing up. I'm glad you like hockey. I'm just not the I'm just not the biggest hockey fan. I just don't like really team sports. Just kind of I'm just kind of uh, too old, I guess, or too young at heart, or something. I don't know. I've gotten the only thing I want to play anymore is League of Legends. All right, Bomb D, thank you. You'll slide into the DMs later. Appreciate it. <laughs> Godspeed, everyone. Until next time, may God be with you on your quest for consistency, kismet, and non-zero-sum creativity. Godspeed. Until we meet again. Danielvada.